Well, at this time, I want to invite you to go to the first book in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. We are in Genesis 11 this morning. And as Jeff said at the top of the service, we are kicking off a brand new sermon series today called Blessed to be a Blessing. And during the next 33 weeks, uh, we will be looking at characters from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, 17 from the Old, 17 from the New Testament, and really looking at each one of their lives, how they were blessed and how they blessed the community, the world, and, and frankly, how they continue to bless us today. And today we are going to begin with a very uh, familiar uh, character, a guy by the name of Abram. Uh, we know him uh, as Abraham as well. Uh, and so we're going to get to that in just a minute. As you're going to uh, the book of Genesis, uh, I want to just uh, invite you to think about your own blessings, uh, your own giftedness. And so I just want to ask you a question. How well do you know how well, how good do you feel about your own giftedness, your own talents, your own skills, those things in your life? How much do you, how confident are you that God has really blessed you and given you gifts so that you can be a blessing in the world? So on a scale of one to 10, everybody just kind of mentally think about where are you at? Z one or zero, you know, not very confident. 10, I know exactly what my gifts are, and I am using them. A couple of years ago, uh, a research organization by the name of the Barna Research Group uh, asked this very question uh, to Americans, uh, hundreds, thousands of Americans all across the United States. How confident are you in your uh, assessment of your gifts, and are you using them? And what they discovered is, uh, after lots and lots of research, that the American average was 6.4 on a scale of 1 to 10. And you might be thinking, oh, that's pretty good, right? That's not too bad. And one thing that they also discovered is whether they were Christians or non-Christian, Barna is actually a Christian research organization, but they asked non-Christians too, is the numbers really didn't change. Whether they were followers of Jesus or not, 6.4 was kind of the, the number where they landed. And I got to thinking, I haven't been in school in a while, but I got to thinking, 6.4, is that a good number? I mean, back when I was in school, you know, 6.4 out of 10, that, you know, uh, translates out to 64%. Is that a good grade? Doug, is that a good grade? If somebody were to turn in a term paper or an exam and they got a 64, would you be like, that's awesome? No. Doug is our resident college professor here, and so I regularly go to him, so put him on the spot. Yeah, I mean, what if you came home from school as a child and said, Mom, Dad, I got a 64? I mean, how would that go for you? Or what if your child came home from school and said, Mom, I got a 64, and you knew that they had potential for greater? I don't think 6.4 or 64% is a very good number. And I'm wondering, and I'm even guessing that even here at Faith Lutheran Church, now I know we are above average here. I know we're better than all the other churches in town. But I don't know that we're that much better. And so for the next 33 weeks, we are going to try to improve our score. We're going to try and get that number closer to 10 for all of us. And I think about this, you know, uh, what, what if like Aaron Rodgers or Paul Goldschmidt or flashback Michael Jordan, they knew they were gifted and they're like, eh, I'm just going to shoot hoops in the driveway. I'm just going to play catch in the backyard. I'm just going to go to the batting cages. I don't want to go onto the public scene. I mean, we would miss out on these incredible athletes. Or what if Andrea Bocelli is like, eh, I'm just going to sing in the shower. Or Taylor Swift or Steve Perry or whoever your mus favorite musician might be just said, you know, I'm never cutting a record. I'm just going to sing driving in the car. I mean, we would all agree that that would be a huge waste of gifts and talents. So the idea behind this sermon series is not just learning about and discovering how God has gifted each one of us, but it's actually putting them into practice. 
actually living them out. Because many of you, I think, you know your gifts, you know your skills, you know your talents, but let's be honest, they're lying a little bit dormant. And so we're going to challenge one another over these next few weeks, thinking about um, how God has gifted us and putting them into practice. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this story of Abram, the story that continues to reverberate in our lives and in the world. And so God, as we've just very briefly scratched the surface of his life this morning, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We first meet Abram in the Old Testament uh, in Genesis 11, 27, if you want to follow along with me in your Bibles. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor were both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran and the father of both Milcah and Ish Iscah. Now Sarai was childless, childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. There are a lot of details there, a lot of names, a lot of geography, so I just want to recap a couple things about Abram's life. I'll just say the first zero to 75 years of his life. First thing we learn, or one of the things we learn about this reading this morning is that uh, he grew up in this town of Ur, which kind of sounds weird to our ears. Um, that's a very strange uh, name. Is it uh, just kind of a little town? Actually, Ur was a, a pretty good size uh, city back in the day, about 100,000 people. Um, they, uh, were, uh, they had theaters, um, they had temples, um, they had uh, statues, um, they had kind of a lot of things going on. They even, have pa even had paved roads and two-story houses. This was not some little village. This was kind of like what we might call the, the exurbs. I mean, this was lots going on. And so Abram had lots of opportunity to be exposed to a lot of different ideas, and a lot of uh, different people. Now, uh, Ur was not a bad place. It was a good place, uh, a wonderful place to raise a family. Ur did have one problem. They loved to worship false gods. There were lots of temples and lots of gods that people worshiped in Ur. And so we, the, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I think it's a, a fairly safe conclusion that Abram's father was a pagan that he did not worship God. He did not worship Yahweh. And therefore, Abram also was a pagan at this time. We don't know exactly, but, but I think we can safely assume that because that's what Ur was known for, is a lot of worshiping of false gods. We also learn in the story that Abram had a couple siblings. And he's, and he's growing up in Ur. Uh, one of his brothers dies. Kind of a tragic, but, you know, we've talked about this the last couple of weeks. Kind of normal. People died young. Children died uh, in, in ancient times. We also know that Abram was married. He was married to Sarai. And we learn in the story that Abr Abram and Sarai, when they came together, uh, they tried to have children, but they couldn't have children. So this went on for quite a while. And so it was this couple, Abram and Sarai, and they could not have children. One day, Abram's father, Terah, loads up the minivan, gets out his GPS, and he puts Canaan. And they go on this road trip to Canaan. And along the way, they stop for a rest area, right? And Abram's dad says, eh, I kind of like it here. Let's stay here. And so they lay down their stuff. They unload the minivan. They settle down. And after a few years, Abram's father dies. The other thing we learn about in the story 
is that Abram is not a young whippersnapper. He's an older guy at this point in time. He's, oh, we'll just say middle age-ish. We don't know exactly, but the story's going to tell us here in a little bit. He's getting up there in years. And so at this point in time in the story, we, we look at Abram's life and we think pretty ordinary, pretty common, pretty normal. They go on this road trip. Nothing really exciting about Abram. We, I don't know that we really learn much about his gifts, his talents, and, or, or anything like that, or even, frankly, if he's using them. But we know he's getting up there in age at this point in time. And so the story continues in Genesis 12. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Remember, they're still not in the promised land. They're still not to Canaan. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So there's it, there it is. 75. Middle age-ish, right? We can all agree. 75 is still middle age-ish. And so they go on this journey. And we see on the map, they start out in Ur. They go up to Haran. They're going to go down to Canaan. They're going to go over to Egypt. They're going to come back to Canaan. And this is kind of their journey that they're going to go on uh, throughout uh, this time. And, and what in the text, what we learn is as they get ready to go on this journey, God promises Abram three things. Real estate. He says, I'm going to give you a land for you and for your people. He's going to promise him that he's going to make him a great nation. Lots of kids. Remember, they're 75. He's 75 years old. His wife is older. He says, you're going you're gonna to be so many people, a great nation. You're going to be a powerful nation. And he's like, really? And he says, I'm also going to make you famous. I'm going to give you notoriety. Generations later, people are going to still be talking about your name. You're going to be blessed, and you are going to be a blessing to the world. So these are the promises that God offers to Abram. And why does God make these promises to Abram? And this is what's so important. We can't miss the why. So that through Abram, all the nations of the world would be blessed. All the people of the earth will be blessed. And this is really setting the stage for the biblical narrative. Genesis through Revelation. Revelation. This idea that God is going to use this one family starting with Abram and Sarai and go all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, all the way to the book of Revelation. Following this one family, they're later going to be known as the Israelites, same family. And God is going to use this family as the conduit to bless all the nations. And what we learn about in 14 chapters in the book of Genesis is the story of Abram. But it's going to continue on and keep going and going. And there's really two themes of the book of, a or the, the man of Abram, this guy. The first theme is about human failure. That Abram is going to fail. He's going to mess up over and over and over. And every time Abram fails, every time he messes up, every time he sins, every time he turns his back from God, every time he steps in it, God is going to come and rescue him. God is going to come and save him. God is going to bail him out of whatever trouble he gets in. And not only that, so it's, it's Abram's human failure, Abram's failure, and God's faithfulness. This is the story of Abram and later Abraham. This is the story of his descendants, of his family line, all the way through this, the, the Old Testament. We see this theme just repeat itself over and over. And we ask ourselves, aren't these people ever going to learn? And the answer is no, they don't. We fail. And God rescues. God saves us and comes to meet us in our greatest hour of need. 
So the text tells us, after God offers the promise to Abram and Sarai, they went. They packed up their bags and they started on their journey. But it wasn't going to be very long before they encounter their first failure, their first problem, their first obstacle on the road. And so as they roll into Egypt, Pharaoh looks at Sarai. Apparently she was an attractive woman. Pharaoh looks at Sarai and says, wow, I would like her to be my wife. And Abram, he's afraid. He's like, uh, yeah, you can have her. She's my sister. And things go really bad. And pretty soon, Pharaoh, uh, the Pharaoh finds out, it's not his sister, it's his wife. And that God starts punishing Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And he's like, why did you do that? And so in this moment, it, um, normally Pharaoh would just execute this guy. He would get rid of him, but somehow God's grace, God's provision comes in and intercedes between Pharaoh and, and Abram. He says, and somehow he walks away from the whole situation. He gets his wife back. Pharaoh chastises him and says, man, that was a terrible thing you did. And you would think that Abram would have learned from that. But we learn a little bit later on in the book of Genesis. There, Abram and Sarai are walking through the wilderness in the Negev desert. And they run into a guy by the name of Abimelech, a powerful guy. And he's like, hey, look at her. And Abram's like, she's my sister. You can have her. Twice, he pawns off his wife to these powerful men. I mean, if, if you think your spouse is a jerk... Abraham was not a great husband. I think we can agree that, right? I mean, who does that? I don't know her. She's my sister. You can have her. I mean, this is, this is Abram. Abraham. This guy, this giant of the faith in Scripture. He was a very sinful, normal guy. And then there was the time that Abram and Sarai, they couldn't have kids. They're getting older and older and older. They're getting even further up there in age. And Sarai comes to Abram and says, hey, you need to have a baby. I obviously can't have children. Here, why don't you take my maidservant, uh, Hagar, and you go sleep with her. And I didn't put a, uh, a slide up there for that one. I thought that might be kind of too much information, right? But Abram's like, all right. And so he does. He goes and sleeps with the servant girl, Hagar. And she gets pregnant. And she has a baby, Ishmael. Are you kidding me? I mean, if you think your family is dysfunctional and messed up, your family's got nothing on Abram and Sarai and their family. And things just get worse and worse. I mean, two women in the house, now a child. It just gets bad and jealousy and anger and hurt. And pretty soon, Sarai says to Hagar, you and that son of yours, get out of here. And so now all of a sudden we've got collateral damage because they're bad mistakes. But God saves. God intercedes. God steps in. And God provides for Hagar, for Ishmael, for Abram, and Sarai. Because then Isaac is born. Sarai is able to conceive in old age. Of course, you know this story. It's a miracle. Sarai gets pregnant in old age. She has a baby. His name is Isaac. God provides in the midst of their mess-ups, their screw-ups, over and over. Then there's the story of, as Isaac gets older, teenager-ish, God comes to Abram again and says, I want you to take your one and only son, Isaac. Grab some wood, go up the mountain, and when you get up there, I want you to perform a sacrifice. And so Abram says to Isaac, come on, boy, grab some wood. We're going up the mountain, Mount Moriah. And as they're walking up, Isaac's like, Dad, Where's the sacrifice? And, and Abram says, the Lord will provide. 
And of course, we know this story. Abram's thinking, Isaac is going to be the sacrifice. And in the moment where Isaac is about ready to be sacrificed by Abram, all of a sudden he hears a voice. He looks up and he sees a ram caught in the thicket. And that ram becomes the sacrifice. So he lifts his son off the altar and puts the ram on the altar. And that makes the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice. I mean, do you hear the foreshadowing? 2,000 years later, another father is going to ask his one and only son to take some wood, go up on a mountain, Mount Calvary, to experience a sacrifice. And this sacrifice would be the atoning sacrifice for all of humanity. It would be a substitute. You and I belong on the altar because of our sin. But Jesus says, I'll do it. This is why we call Jesus the Lamb of God. Hey, one more fun thing uh, about Abram's life that you probably know this story as well. Abram is about 100 years old now. He's, he's an old man. We, we can agree that 100 is old. He's old, and God comes to him. And at this point in time, he and Sarai, this is kind of flashback a little bit. They still don't have any kids. And they're getting discouraged. They're getting frustrated. And God shows up to Abram one night in the tent. He says, hey, come on out of the tent. Look up at the sky. Look at the stars. And he renews this covenant, this promise that he made back in Genesis 12. This is now in Genesis 15. He says, look at the stars of the sky. That's how many your ancestors are going to be. And they still don't have any children. And now he's 100 years old. And God says, I'm still going to make that happen. You're still getting real estate. You're still going to have a great nation. And you are still going to be famous. You are going to be blessed. And you are going to bless the nations. And Abraham... Abram's like, uh, uh, all right, I, I, I don't see how that's going to happen. And God says, there's going to be a special sign. Let's, let's make a special sign between you and me. And that special sign, we're going to call it a covenant. And it's going to declare that you, you have a special relationship with me. So call the boys from the village, get them together, and we're going to have this special sign. And Abram's probably thinking, ooh, maybe tattoos or something, Right? We're going to have like bro tattoos. It's going to say Yahweh or I, I don't know what it's going to say. And so he calls all the boys from the village together. It's like, okay, God, what's the sign? God says, circumcision. And they're like, what? This is really strange. But this becomes the sign between God and his people. So they have a child, Isaac. Pretty soon, Sarai, Abram, at this point in time, with the, the circumcision and the covenant, God changes his name to, from Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. And this renewed covenant, this renewed relationship. And they grow old together, raise young Isaac into a young man, and then Sarah dies. She's buried. Abraham gets remarried, a woman by the name of Keturah, and they have six more children, six more boys, actually. Six more boys, and so he's got all these kids. And if you ever went to vacation Bible school, maybe you sang that song, Father Abraham had seven sons. Seven sons had Father Abraham. You know that song? This is the seven sons, Isaac with Sarah and the other six boys who kind of fade in to the, the pages of history. We don't know a lot about them because what we learn uh, a few years later is that uh, Abraham also dies in Genesis 25. And after he dies, what we learn is they open up the will and they discover that Abraham left everything to Isaac. So these other six get completely cut out. Again, if you think your family's jacked up, and you want to make problems for your kids, give all your inheritance to your firstborn and see what the other kids do to one another. 
This is just how they rolled. And I, I think these are important details that we shouldn't skip over. But this is how they did it. So what was the legacy of Abraham? What did he do? What did he accomplish? I think one of the most important things we need to look at, he is one of the most chronicled people in the entire Bible. Over and over and over, we're going to read about Abraham, Father Abraham. And they keep talking about him. Jesus talks about Abraham well into the New Testament. In fact, nobody is written more about in the New Testament other than Moses than Abraham. Seventy-four times his name comes up in the New Testament. I mean, his, his legacy, his life, this is 2,000 years later by the time we get to Jesus. So 4,000 years ago, they are writing about Abraham over and over and over, mostly about his failures. And I just gave you a couple here. Nobody's like, oh, he was such an awesome guy. People are like, man, he was really a screw up. But God rescued him every single time. He had faith. And he walked out and stepped into that faith. But man, he made a lot of mistakes. Man, did he sin a lot. Another uh, legacy of uh, Abraham is that he is the father of three faiths. If you speak to a Jewish person today, hey, who's the, the father of your faith? Jewish people will tell you, Father Abraham. Of course, we Christians, we refer to Abraham as Father Abraham. And if you were to talk to a Muslim, hey, who's the father of your faith? They would say, Father Abraham. In the lineage of Hagar and Ishmael, the servant. We'll talk about that in another sermon. But there's about 8 billion people on the planet today. Over half of, of the population on the earth, planet earth today, refer to Abraham as Father Abraham. I think we can agree that God made him famous. 4,000 years ago, we are still talking about, and Father Abraham is still being known. The, the last thing I want to say about uh, the legacy of Abraham is that he was the first missionary. He was the one who God came to him and said, I want you to go. Pick up your stuff and I want you to go. And in your going, what I want you to do is to be a blessing to the nation and blessing to the world. So he was a man on the move. He was a man who, who went and obeyed and followed God and made lots and lots of mistakes and lots and lots of sin. But along the way, God blessed him and used him to bless the nations. So 2,000 years later, after Abraham, when Jesus comes along and makes that great uh, commission, go and make disciples, everybody's like, oh yeah, we know what that means. They're talking about Abraham again. We know what it means to pick up our stuff and go and serve and bless other people. The Anglican theologian uh, John Stott said it this way, God chose one man and his family in order through them to bless all families on the earth. Here we are 2,000 years after Jesus, and we continue to look uh, back even further to Father Abraham. So how? How was Abram blessed? How was Abraham blessed? How was he gifted? How did, how did he have his skills? How did he use his skills in ministry? I think it's the wrong question. I think the most important takeaway, the most important learning from the story of Abraham is not how he used his gifts, but who gave him his gifts. Who is the one who came to him? Who was the one who promised to him? Who was the one who walked alongside him? Who was the one who continued to rescue him? Who was the one who continued to save him? Who was the one who continued to bail him out? It's not about what Abraham did. It's truly about how he was called by God. God is the, 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 the most important person in the life of Abraham. That's the point of the story, I think, of Abraham. It's not what he did. It's who he was because God had called him. Remember, Abraham was likely a pagan. He wasn't looking for God. 
He wasn't worshiping God. God came to him in the midst of his sin, in the midst of his rebellion, in the midst of not looking for God at all. God's like, hey, I want a relationship with you. I want a special relationship with you. And this is the story of the Bible over and over and over, Genesis through Revelation. God comes to us. We don't go looking to God. We don't go looking for God. While we were yet still sinners, God comes to us. And so if you're feeling really good about being a Jesus follower, I just want to knock you off your pedestal. You weren't looking for God. He found you. And he tapped you on the shoulder and says, I want to have a special relationship with you. And this goes back earlier in the book of Genesis because there's this strong relationship between God and his people. And in Genesis 1, we read this when God is creating the world. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's this special relationship between the creator and the creation. And those of you who are parents, you understand this. We have a love for our kids that is absolutely unexplainable. And I never got this until I was a parent. I'm like, yeah, my parents love me, right? But until you become a parent, you can't fully understand the love a parent has for a child. I mean, we just love our kids like crazy. No matter how much they mess up, no matter how much they walk away from us, you're just like, oh, I'm just going to go after them. This is the kind of love God has for us, for you, for me. No matter how much we sin, God comes after us. Not because we've done anything, not because we've accomplished anything, but because he created us. It's our identity. We're made in his image. We've talked about this several times over the last seven weeks. The, the theological term is imago Dei. And the idea is that we are made in the image of God. That's why. God loves us and cares so much about us. And when we understand that we are made in the image of God, it helps us to understand we, we become confident and, and comfortable in our own skin. We're like, I have value, not because of anything I've done, but because I am a child of God. And when you fully get that, when you fully embrace this idea of imago Dei, that I am a child of God, I am loved no matter what, we can just be like, all right, God, you made me in your image. And it makes us really curious and it makes us really want to start to discover who God made us in our gifts, in our talents, in our passions, so that we too can be a blessing to the world. And when we understand that we are made in the image of God, that every other human being is also made in the image of God. We got to get it both right. Because if we just think we're made in the image of God, we got problems. We start looking down our nose at other people. But we can never forget that every single human being on the face of the earth, whether they follow Jesus or not, whether they, how much they sin or not, they are loved and made in the image of God. And as, as Christ followers, we are to look at them. We are to treat them with that same kind of dignity, love, and respect. This is who Jesus was, right? Didn't matter who he was looking eyeball to eyeball with. He loved them. He respected them, regardless of their background, regardless of how much they, sin they had in their life. And so I want, if, if, you're, if you've just kind of been tuning out this morning, just kind of, I don't know, thinking about football this afternoon, or have any of you ever counted the number of pillars up here? If you've been doing that, I need you to stop. And I want you to hear this. This is the most important thing this morning. You are a gift from God. You are a gift from God. Your life is a gift from God. I want you to tell the person you're sitting next to, you're a gift from God. Do it right now. Winton, did you tell Mary she's a gift from God? Mary, did you tell Winton? You did, okay. 
We all got to do this. We got to look at one another and tell them that they are a gift from God and treat them like they're a gift from God. This is so fundamental, so basic, so foundational to before we start looking at and examining and thinking about our own gifts or anybody else's gifts, we have to begin with this place of we are gifts from God because when we begin with this foundation, it makes all the difference in the world. How many of you are going to watch football today or thinking about football today? A couple of you? All right, four of you. That's awesome. So, you know, those of you who follow football maybe, you probably know this story, July 1961. Green Bay Packer training camp. Vince Lombardi stands in front of his guys, his football players. He says, gentlemen, this is a football. You know that story, right? Why was Vince Lombardi known as one of the greatest football coaches, perhaps one of the greatest athletic coaches ever? Because he understood the importance of the fundamentals, of laying a firm foundation, of starting with the most basic important aspects of the football game. Gentlemen, this is a football. This is what it means, I think, as we kick off off this sermon series of blessed to be a blessing. It's understanding the fundamentals, that you are a gift Every one of us are a gift, and everyone walking on the earth today is a gift. So what do we do with this? Where do we go from here? I think one of the best ways for us to lean into and practice this idea that we are gifts from God, that all people are gifts from God, is to gather together in a small group. Of course, we call these life groups here at Faith Lutheran Church. Over the past X number of years, I don't even know how many years, I was thinking through all the life groups, uh, small groups I've been a part of in the years. I've been a part of 17 uh, small groups through the years. And each one, uh, lots and lots of just rich stories and memories. And for me, some of the most important part of being a part of a life group or a small group is that commitment to those other people. It's just knowing that it's on the calendar, And I'm going to show up and spend time with them. And I'm going to hear their stories. And they're going to hear my stories. And we're going to do life together. And walk alongside the highs and the lows together. And so it's that commitment. I can tell you, um, I've been in ministry probably close to 30 years. There has been nothing more impactful in my life than being a part of a small group through the years. Not Sunday worship, not seminary, not studying scripture, not going on mission trips, not going on retreats. Those have all been really, really good things, don't get me wrong. But what has been most transformational, most helpful in my own spiritual growth is walking alongside other Jesus followers, other people to do life with. This is how important it's been to me. This is why I stand up here week after week and I yak at you about, gosh, you need to be in a small group. You need to be in a life group because it's been so important for me and it's been that commitment. And I'm going to just be real honest with you. Some weeks I don't feel like going to group. I don't. Some weeks I'm like, ah, I got, I've got stuff going on. I got a sermon to write. I'm busy. I got things going on. And sometimes it's just like, ah, those people, They're needy. They're annoying, right? I mean, can we be honest? Sometimes going to life group or small group is just hard because they're people. And I'll bet you there are people in my small group who are like, man, I'm so glad Brian's not here this week. Right? I mean, this is just the way it is. It's hard being a part of a small group. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's not just like awesome, awesome all the time. It's hard work sometimes, but it's gratifying. It's fulfilling. It encourages me so much. And I think one of the ways, not only because of the commitment, the regular commitment, but it's also because I'm around people who are different than me. Different ages, 
different genders, different lifestyles, different everything. We sit down, we have these conversations, just like, my goodness, this is hard. But this is rich. Because they are gifts from God. They are made in the image of God. And I need to love them because of whose they are. So if you're in a life group, awesome. What I want to challenge you, what I want to encourage you, is to put it on the calendar. Make it a priority in your life. And show up even when you don't feel like going. And if you're not in a life group, you can join a life group. We got openings here, and all you have to do is put your name back there uh, on the list. We'll talk to you about how you can get plugged in. This is what I think it means to lean into the story of Abraham. A guy who seems pretty ordinary, pretty messed up, pretty broken, certainly lots of sin. He had this little kernel of faith to follow God. And all along the way, God led him and guided him. Not because of what he did or how he was gifted or how he was talented, but, but whose he was. He was made in the image of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for this incredible man and the ways in which he continues to speak to us today. So Lord, whatever we do with this message today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch us teach us, lead us, guide us, humble us, and empower us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.